by Network Computing and Ixia and broadcast by UBM. I'm Michael Krieger, and I'll be your moderator today. We have just a few announcements before we get started. First of all, the slides will advance automatically throughout the event. You can also download a copy of the slides by clicking on the green folder icon located at the bottom of your screen. You can participate, and we encourage you to, in our Q&A session by asking questions at any time during this webinar. Just type your question into the Q&A window to the right of the presentation window, then click the Submit button. At the end of the webinar, we will ask you to complete our feedback form. Your feedback will provide us with valuable information on how we can improve future events. You can also launch the survey at any time by clicking on the red survey button at the bottom of the console. And at this time, we recommend you disable your pop-up blockers. If you're experiencing any technical problems, please type your issue into the Q&A text area, and we will be glad to offer one-on-one -on -one assistance. Now on to the presentation, Six Ways Network Visibility Can Optimize Your Network. Discussing today's topics are Keith Bromley, Paul Agito, and Ben Cowan. Keith Bromley is a Senior Manager for Solutions Marketing at Ixia. His quarter century of industry experience includes both engineering and marketing roles. He's known as a subject matter expert and industry spokesman on topics including network monitoring, management systems, UC, IP telephony, SIP, wireless, and wireline. Paul Agito is a filter artist who can find needles in the haystacks of network traffic. As a systems engineer at Ixia, his expertise is in delivering the right packets and metadata to network performance and security tools. And Ben Cowan is a visibility specialist with Ixia and is a subject matter expert on inline security and active monitoring solutions. His 20 plus years of experience have earned him an alphabet soup of certifications uh, while working at Cisco and others. Uh, Keith, over to you. Okay, thank you, Michael. Hello everyone, here's the agenda for today's webinar. First, I'll provide a brief overview of network visibility to give everyone a level set. Then I'll start the discussion on how you can use visibility solutions to optimize your network. After that, my colleagues and I will present 15 different solution sets and show you how to get the most benefit from each one. Finally, we'll wrap things up and give you a chance to ask some questions. First off, what is network visibility? Hopefully you've heard the term before. If not, welcome to the club as you are now an initiate. Network visibility is the ability to see what is and what is not happening on your network. It's not just monitoring. That is part of it, but it's also about exposing blind spots, eliminating problems, and understanding your specific network. The source of many network problems is network visibility, or actually the lack of it. Lack of visibility is caused by blind spots, areas where you don't actually see everything that is happening. Blind spots exist in almost every network. It's not a question of if, but where. Blind spots result from many sources, including the organizational structure of the business, technology complexity, and even the monitoring and network equipment itself. As you can see here, there are some examples of common blind spots department silos, virtualization technology, rogue IT, span port usage, new equipment, and network complexity. Each one of these blind spots could be a 10 to 15 minute discussion as to what they entail and the issues associated with them. So I'll stop here for now, but we'll circle back to this subject near the end of the presentation. Just as a note though, if you want more information on blind spots, you can check out a blog I wrote in August and post it on the ICSIA website. It actually reviews 16 common blind spots and their sources. So what's the solution? It's something called a visibility architecture. A visibility architecture is simply a way to step back and take a look at your network, organize your network monitoring strategy, and then integrate that strategy with other strategies like network security and troubleshooting. By creating a visibility architecture, and it's a fairly simple task, you get a better understanding of what tools you have, where they access the network, and what data feeds into them. From there, you can optimize your monitoring strategy by pooling resources, load balancing data across tools, filtering out non-pertinent data to the tools, and integrating tools and data flows to eliminate problems faster than before. We've literally seen customers reduce their mean time to repair by up to 80% simply by creating a visibility architecture. 
There are three basic components to visibility architecture, the access layer, control layer, and the traditional monitoring tool layer. In the past, people have typically said that the monitoring tools are the strategy, and so they, they didn't really need to plan anything else out. As a consequence, most enterprises have a mixture of all sorts of tools, many they don't even use, a lot of unnecessary complexity, and then they still have a lot of network problems. Basically, the problems never magically disappeared. This is where a visibility architecture really helps. The first layer of the model is access. This is provided by some sort of network access device, whether it's a physical tap, virtual tap, or a mirrored port. In case everyone isn't completely familiar with taps and what they are, a traditional tap is a piece of hardware that you insert into the network. It makes a copy of all the packets, whether they are good or bad. This copy can then be sent to monitoring equipment to be processed. Once the tap is inserted into the network, it's essentially set and forget. You normally don't have to do any programming to them. Taps are used for, quote, out-of-band monitoring, unquote, because the monitoring equipment is not directly in the flow of the network traffic. The tap is, but after that, all equipment that is receiving a copy of the traffic is completely out of the traffic path for the network traffic. You can connect or disconnect whatever equipment you want to the tap monitoring port, and it will not affect the rest of the network. A second type of network access is a virtual tap, which is a software version of the hardware tap that you can use for VMware, KVM, Hyper-V, et cetera, type of environments. The virtual tap allows you to export monitoring data outside of the virtual environment to security and monitoring tools in the physical data center. And uh, actually, we'll actually come back to virtual taps later on and talk about them more. The third type of network access is called a bypass switch. Think of this as a special tap for monitoring tools that you insert directly into the flow of network data. If you had just inserted the tool and it failed completely or you yanked the tool out, this would directly affect, i.e. stop, the flow of data to the rest of the network. This is why we call it inline. Once a bypass tap is installed, connecting tools and monitoring equipment becomes more of a non-issue. The bypass tap adds in failover protection so that the network disruptions are minimized to milliseconds. This way, if the tool has a problem, or if you want to change tools out, the bypass functionality can be engaged so that the bypass switch continues to pass all traffic directly downstream. Heartbeat signaling between the bypass switch and tools ensures automatic failovers for tool failures. This provides maximum network uptime. A fourth type of access is called span ports, also called mirroring ports, off of a network switch. While they make a mirrored copy of data, there are lots of issues with them, such as they require programming, they have security issues, and they only give summarized data, not a complete copy of all the packets. In fact, span ports themselves are one of the reasons you can develop network blind spots. So again, check out that blog I referenced if you want more, more information on span ports. The next layer uses a network packet broker, also called an NPB, which allows you to filter, aggregate, and load balance data from a business point of view, there are several high-level benefits that packet brokers provide. This includes connectivity, reduced tool costs, scaling, reliability, and longevity. But packet brokers are designed to augment your, your monitoring tools, not replace them. In essence, they're a low-cost way to help turbocharge the efficiency and capabilities of your monitoring tools. There are different sizes and capabilities associated with different packet brokers. All packet brokers should perform filtering, load balancing, aggregation, and advanced features like deduplication for layer two through four data. Some also provide application layer features like application filtering, net flow generation, SSL decryption, data masking, etc. The exact feature set depends upon your needs. There are also packet brokers that offer specialized functions for inline or out of band deployments. For instance, an inline uh, packet broker that is inserted between a bypass switch and the inline security tool can offer capabilities like high availability for mission-critical deployments, the serial chaining of security tools, load balancing of data inline tools, and filtering of inline data to improve the efficiency of various tools like IPSs. Out-of-band solutions can help you optimize your out-of-band tool deployments as well, and they can help you control costs. After the packet broker are the monitoring tools. This is probably what most people are familiar with. Instead of receiving the, the data directly from a tap, these tools now receive filtered data that is more relevant and concise. This makes the tools more efficient. If you want details on any of these three areas, check out the IX Vision architecture on the Exit website.
Let's look at packet brokers a little closer. With the network tap, you get a complete copy of all the raw data, like I said before, and this sends it on to the tools. Unfortunately, from the tool perspective, this is like drinking from a street-level water main. There is a lot of data that can quickly overwhelm the monitoring tools, and your tools are limited to the fixed number of ingress ports they have on the device. With the network packet broker, we introduce filtering. Basic packet brokers can do layer two through four filtering load balancing. So it means we can filter on the source and destination IP address, port numbers, VLANs, etc., which minimizes the amount of traffic going to each tool. And this is certainly an improvement. It makes more efficient use of tool capacity and makes it easy to scale the tools as needed. But this is still akin to drinking from a fire hydrant now for the tools. The volume is less than before, but it's still a lot. More advanced packet brokers can do much more. Most notably, they can perform deduplication of traffic to minimize the traffic a tool must process. They also provide trimming to remove uh, packet payload if it isn't needed, and they can, pro they can do uh, protocol stripping so tools can analyze encapsulated traffic like GTP, MPLS, and other tunneling protocols. And some even have deep buffering to provide burst protection for tools that operate at lower speeds. This all greatly reduces the traffic that the tools need to analyze, all of which makes the monitoring solution much more efficient. Now the flow of data is the size of a water pipe going into your house, and the tool can spend its maximum CPU capability uh, processing relevant data, not on functions like deduplication. And then finally, ICSI provides a more advanced level of intelligence on our packet brokers. What I mean by this is that our packet brokers are able to process application intelligence, which lets the packet broker do uh, true signature-based application identification and filtering along with the correlation of metadata information like geolocation, user device type, and user browser type. This gives you much more control over exactly what you want to monitor. And if your tools can't consume packet-level data, the packet broker can uh, generate NetFlow metadata. But we go beyond simple NetFlow and provide additional metadata that gives your tools very con detailed contextual information. Now the flow of data is the size of a garden hose. You've got the right amount of data going to the right tools. And this is all very detailed information, but what it really means is that your monitoring tools can now be much more intelligent not just more efficient. The tools have access to data and intelligence in a way not possible with other visibility solutions. Next, I wanted to cover two common types of visibility solutions. So I referred to an out-of-band visibility solution earlier. I thought I would show a basic picture to make it clear. As you can see, the packet broker and tools are not in the flow of the network traffic. The tap is, but nothing else is. I thought I would also flash this picture for you. This, the diagram I just showed you was a basic one. This one's a little more detailed. It shows that monitoring data will come in from many network locations and sources. This affects the size of the network packet broker needed because it then feeds 5, 10, 15, maybe even 20 different security and monitoring tools. And those tools have different requirements, like they need unencrypted data, or they can only handle certain data rates like 1 or 10G, or they want to see specific data content. Here is the second visibility solution that we commonly refer to as inline visibility. Simply put, this means that the tap, which is actually a bypass switch, and the packet broker are directly in the path of the data flow. If either of these components fail, the flow of data stops. Fortunately, solutions like the one from Ixia have failover and redundancy options that eliminate the failover concern. Okay, so now you know what visibility architectures are. So what can we really do with them? Here you go. There are Lots of solution sets. There's literally 50 to 60 different use cases for network visibility. They can all pretty much be organized into the six categories you see here, though. Um, some provide cost containment and cost reduction capabilities. Others are all about improving network security. Others help optimize network performance. Some are used to speed up troubleshooting efforts and, and improve network reliability. 
other strengthened regulatory compliance, and then a final set is for those that help remove network blind spots. These six areas are where the rubber meets the road. As I mentioned earlier, we've collected two to three solution sets per category. I don't expect that all 15 solution sets will apply to everybody, but I'm confident that you can hopefully find at least one, if not two to five, that will be useful to you. One note here, we've grouped the various out-of-band and inline solutions according to the six different categories. So the solution sets, as presented here, aren't intended to build upon one another. They are independent of each other. This approach allows us to focus on the solution itself and stimulate you to think about how the solutions might be of use, rather than focusing on installed equipment, rollout plans, prerequisites for a solution, etc. Okay, so let's start looking at the solutions. And at this point, I'm going to hand things over to uh, Ben for his expert insight into some of these use cases. Thanks, Keith. Uh, so let's jump into some of these solution sets. Uh, the first solution set illustrates how the taps and bypass switches that are installed in your architecture will send the monitoring data to a central collection point, and that collection point being the network packet broker that Keith previously spoke of. Uh, that NPB will handle aggregation, filtering, load balancing, and advanced packet uh, processing as well. Since the data coming in from the TAP is a complete copy of all the data, some of it will need to be filtered before being sent to the appropriate monitoring tool. This removes non-pertinent information and reduces the clutter being sent to the tools. Filtering means that only the right information is sent to the tools, and it can be segmented out so that only certain pieces of the information go to specific tools. This is one of the most commonly used packet broker features. Other functions such as deduplication, packet slicing, time stamping, and data masking can be applied to the data as required to condition it. These features make the monitoring tools more efficient, which means they can process more data than they could without the packet broker. Uh, for instance, if spam ports are used, then they often create a lot of duplicate data because of the way that the data capture is performed. If you're also looking at data from multiple network segments, then you will typically see duplicate data being sent to the monitoring tools. We've actually seen examples where 40% or more of the data customers were sending to their tools was indeed duplicate. Uh, it depends upon your architecture. Uh, as to how the duplicate monitoring, uh, as to how much uh, of the duplicate monitoring uh, data you will have. Uh, advanced context aware data processing features like deduplication uh, within the packet broker can remove these uh, duplicate and repeat packets. Some tools can do this as well. The issue with doing this at the tool is that you're now spending tool CPU resources and time to perform this capability, this function. Uh, this slows down the processing capability and might even necessitate buying another tool to handle the extra load. Since tools are often expensive, this can become a costly choice. A packet broker is usually a more cost-efficient uh, cost uh, alternative. Another very important use case for decreasing cost is load balancing. There are a couple clear examples of how load balancing can help most enterprises. First, network traffic increases along with the traffic speed. Uh, network traffic increases along uh, as network traffic uh, increases, uh, and that's a very common occurrence uh, within an enterprise. I'm sure you've seen this in your own network as well, but what about the monitoring impacts of the bandwidth upgrades? For instance, if you upgrade your network core from 1 gig to 10 gig, you will now need 10 gig tools to properly monitor it. If you upgrade from, what happens if you upgrade from 40 gig to 100 gig? There may be few or no monitoring tools uh, that are capable of processing data at those rates. Packet brokers uh, provide the aggregation and load balancing capabilities needed. Uh, as you can see here, data coming into the packet broker can be broken down into lower rate uh, streams of data and then sent to the proper monitoring tools. For instance, load balancing of 40 gig data allows you to spread the monitoring traffic across multiple 10 gig tools if you need to. This obviously assumes that you have enough 10 gig tools for the load. Once you implement this, you can extend the life of your 10 gig tools a little longer until you have the budget to purchase more expensive tools that can handle the higher data rates. 
Uh, this can be a big help as IT budgets aren't infinite and can often get cut for other business needs. With load balancing, you might you might be able to do the network conversion you want this year and then purchase additional higher rate monitoring tools over the course of the next couple years. Uh, another example is to pull your tools in one location and feed them data they need from a packet broker. Some architectures use individual tools spread out across the network. This may have some minor access advantages, but these tools are often underutilized. Uh, 2016 survey uh, from EMA shows that 32% of enterprise tools are underloaded, uh, and that means that they're less than 50% utilized. Tool centralization and load balancing allows you to pool your tools and increase this utilization by using less tools. A byproduct is that you can often postpone purchases of additional tools until the utilization factor is high enough uh, to warrant additional tools. The next example utilizes the inline visibility solution that Keith talked about earlier. Uh, as you can see, a bypass switch is inserted after the firewall. A network packet broker is then inserted between the bypass switch and the inline security tools, like an IPS, uh, something like that. Incidentally, you could connect the firewall to a bypass switch as well. This would give you more reliability than a firewall or firewalls uh, or multiple firewalls connected directly online. In any case, uh, all traffic reaches the bypass switch and is then forwarded to the packet broker. One very critical aspect of this is that you can filter out the traffic uh, at the packet broker for certain types of traffic from trusted sources, like RTP and video. Uh, that traffic doesn't really need to be inspected by the, the web application firewall. Uh, this uninteresting traffic can be identified and passed right back to the bypass switch and continue downstream. This means that that WAF or IPS doesn't have to spend any of its CPU resources analyzing irrelevant data. Uh, if your network comprises this type of data, you can implement this feature and reduce the load on your secur security tools. Uh, we've seen instances where up to 35% of low-risk network traffic can skip inspection. This automatically increases the effective bandwidth of the IPS tool by 35%. Uh, this means you this means you may be able to delay the purchase of an additional IPS. Uh, we all know that network traffic is increasing, so you're going to need more capacity on your IPS. Uh, it's really a question of whether you want to minimize the cost uh, you will incur or not. The next solution is also an inline solution. Uh, in this situation, we are showing you how you can increase network reliability and security by implementing survivability. There are two common options, full redundancy, uh, and that's typically achieved with a uh, primary and secondary or standby set of tools, uh, and then what is commonly referred to as N plus one, where you have all the tools connected and functioning with a little bit of extra capacity by one. Uh, let's look at the first option. Uh, and this is just an example. Um, if you have uh, specific requirements, questions that you would like to uh, dig into, give us a call. Call Ixia, and we can go through your specific use cases. Um, so for the full redundancy option illustrated here, uh, this is a highly effective um, uh, method at maintaining maximum network and tool uptime. You literally have a second copy of everything. Um, you have a second bypass switch, a second NPB, uh, duplicate tools. If one component or path fails, the secondary equipment can handle load, the load. Uh, while this option yields the highest level of mean time between failure, uh, it also comes at a high price, uh, and it's literally a doubling of the cost for everything. Um, by using a redundant external bypass switch and packet brokers, you can increase your network uptime and reliability beyond the, the level provided with just redundant tools. In fact, the external bypass switch and packet broker can reliably connect the redundant tools in a more cost-effective and less complicated manner than special purpose load balancing devices. An external bypass approach has the benefits of delivering a superior uh, resi uh, resiliency due to more granular failure detection, faster failover, and better application session integrity. This reduces the cost of the system while making it more resilient at the same time. Of course, you can always make trade-offs to reduce your cost. Since you have a redundant bypass switch and packet broker, maybe you don't need a redundant set of tools. You'll count on the other equipment to provide the reliability. This option 
could save you a lot of money as well as um, as well as we know how expensive security tools uh, can can be. Another option is to implement an N plus one uh, design. Let's say you need four IPS tools to process your traffic uh, just to handle the load and the capacity needed. In this case, you would add a fifth IPS. The packet broker would then load balance the traffic across all five devices uh, in that cluster. Should any one of the tools fail, the packet broker can load balance the full load across any of the remaining uh, four IPSs. This provides a good level of survivability at a fraction of the cost uh, of a fully redundant system. Again, if you would like to have more survive for survivability, uh, like an N plus two situation, then you can do that to all the way up to a full redundant set of tools. It just depends on the level of risk you feel comfortable with and your budget. This solution covers how application intelligence can be used to help improve network security by exposing indicators of compromise. As Keith mentioned earlier, uh, packet brokers can perform filtering and other functions for application data, flow data, and metadata to provide a higher level of intelligence within your visibility architecture. This intelligence provides actionable insight that you can use uh, to see uh, macroscopic trends and indicators of issues across your network. Consider this. According to a 2016 Verizon DBIR report, almost 68% of breach, breaches happen over the course of several days. So a rapid response to security threat, threats could help minimize the cost of a breach based upon this information. Unfortunately, this is not the norm. Uh, according to a 2016 TrustWave Global Security Report, the average time for breach detection was 168 days. This gives the intruder, intruder plenty of time to exfiltrate any data they want. Uh, what if this wasn't the case, though? What if you could reduce 128 days to 128 seconds? What if it would be, would that, would that be worth uh, the cost uh, of the visibility architecture? Would that be worth something to you? Uh, forget 128 seconds. What if you could actually shorten that to any time period? Well, you can, and, and this is just one example of how to do it. So in this case, I'm showing an example of some bad actor over in Eastern Europe or North Korea uh, or anywhere in the world, um, and uh, we can uh, look at how that bad actor uh, portrays, uh, um, infiltrates your environment. The, actor, the bad actor gets into your network and starts transferring files from a server in Dallas. Uh, application intelligence, or at least the Ixia version of it, can combine application information, bandwidth information, and geolocation information to show that someone in Eastern Europe has access to the, the server in Dallas using FTP, and is transferring that data to a location back to Eastern Europe. So is this a problem? Well, it depends upon whether you have any authorized users in Eastern Europe or not. Uh, if not, uh, I'd be investigating this as soon as possible. In any case, you have the information right in front of you. It's up to you what to do with it. And it does not take 168 days to discover this. Uh, it's actually much closer to a couple minutes, 128 seconds. This is just one example of how application intelligence can expose indicators of compromise. If you want inform, uh, more information on this subject, we have a new solution brief on the ICSI website, so check it out. Uh, this is another example I'll cover, uh, and this takes full advantage of the application intelligence information. It shows how information uh, flow data and geographic information can be combined to show what applications are running on your network, how much bandwidth each of those applications needs uh, and is using, and what the geographic usage is for those applications. This data can then be exported to other applications, say Splunk, uh, for long-term data connection and performance trending. The main benefit is that this helps you budget upgrades and new equipment installations better. Another benefit of this is that you can see if there are bandwidth bursts or what's happening. For instance, one mobile carrier a few years back had a situation where a new smartphone app was introduced. It was an interactive application between multiple users. Customers loved the app and usage skyrocketed. In fact, over the course of a couple of weeks, uh, the, bandwidth consume, the, the bandwidth consumed became exorbitant uh, for the mobile carrier, and the network was actually crushed and was out of service for several hours. 
all due to this one app. This resulted in a loss of revenue, a huge public embarrassment for that service provider. Um, had the carrier been using application intelligence, the bandwidth consumption of that particular application would have shown up on the dashboard. The system admin could have easily seen the bandwidth explosion in real time. Armed with that information, they could have put controls in place that would have prevented the network outage that occurred. So these are just some examples. Uh, at this point, I'm going to hand things over to Paul and let him cover a few more. Thanks, Ben. We're going to talk now about proactive monitoring in the next solution. In this situation, visibility technology can be used to go out and proactively test your network. According to the EMA 2016 report, 40% of network problems are detected and reported by end users. In addition, 26% report that one of their top networking challenges is the lack of end-to-end -end multi-site network visibility and troubleshooting capability. This is where proactive troubleshooting can help. Proactive monitoring has several fundamental benefits, including the ability to know immediately what the performance level of your network is, or the ability to understand how well your applications are running, and the ability to validate service level agreements both on-premises and in the cloud. And last, the ability to actively test network upgrades during a maintenance window before your company employees do. So if we go back to the first two items I mentioned, network performance and application performance, these sound simple but can actually be difficult to ascertain. To get a true indication of network performance, the network needs to have a good, I mean a large amount of traffic on it. This often makes you dependent on busy peak hours and so forth. But with proactive monitoring solutions, you can place probes anywhere in your network to test whatever you want to and whenever you want to. A proactive monitoring solution resolves other issues as well. For example, how will an, AFM t an APM tool know if the application is truly performing well without the proper loading? You also need the right traffic. So how do you go about instrumenting the network to be exactly like it needs to be, say with small packets, or with a specific volume of traffic that is Skype-like if you want to test your IM, voice, or video solution? Another useful capability is to get an end-to-end -end user perspective of network and application performance. How does it look from their vantage point? A good monitoring solution allows IT teams to use inexpensive active probes on their network to provide 24-7 access. Other functions, like SLA validation, can be done during business hours since they aren't service disrupting. That allows you to validate the SLA performance at will. The information gathered can then be used to inform management about which goals are being met. If goals aren't being met, you can use the impartial data you've collected and contact your vendor to have them either fix any observed network problems or give you a discount if they're failing to meet the agreed upon SLAs. One of the best benefits of visibility architectures though is once you put the equipment into the network, you rarely have to touch the physical network again, especially in the case of an out-of-band solution. Once a tap is installed, it's set and forget technology. It sits there passively forwarding a copy of all traffic to the network packet broker. Since the monitoring data is cop captured, copied by the tap, you can do whatever you want because it won't affect the network. That has the huge benefit of eliminating most, if not all, change board approvals for troubleshooting purposes. You already have access to the data. If you combine that with a packet broker, you've got instant access to pretty much all the data you need across your network for troubleshooting. No need to wait hours, days, or even weeks for permission to touch the network. You should also have the tools connected to the packet broker as well. If both sides are connected, that's the network data and the tools, then you have immediate access for troubleshooting problems. That also means no crash cart. So no time wasted trying to find the cart, making sure the cart has all the tools it needs, 
or moving it around to troubleshoot multiple locations. In addition, you can eliminate accidental network failure and problems due to tool insertion during crisis events. The tools are already connected. This is what I'm showing in the images on the slide. If you look on the left, that's a basic process interview. An alert happens, you investigate it, open a ticket, ask for change board permission to touch the network, assemble the crash cart, wait for a maintenance window, and finally get some troubleshooting time in. If you don't have enough time, you do it all over. Finally resolve the issue and close the ticket. On the right side, you can visualize where the effort gets cut. Unless you're touching a mission critical component, you skip the change board approval, go straight to debugging. No crash card or maintenance window needed. Isolate the problem, and if you need to touch the network as, it, as, as you find that out, then follow your change board and maintenance window policies for the final fix. On top of that, a new packet a good packet broker gives you remote access. That's really convenient if it's 2 in the morning and a problem occurs. You can remote in and start the troubleshooting process and acti activate the packet broker and use it to do the troubleshooting. The whole set of functionality has a big impact on reducing the mean time to repair. We've literally seen customers that can reduce that time by up to 80% simply by using a visibility solution to eliminate the change board approvals. Misuse case is another one that takes advantage of application intelligence, some that have been introduced. According to the EMA report, network teams spent 36% of their time on reactive troubleshooting. This means less time on value-added projects. On top of that, research from Zeus Caravalla shows that up to 85% of the time associated with a network mean time to repair is simply spent trying to figure out that there actually is a problem in the network. So identifying a common denominator among the people can be important to minimizing outage durations. The key is to investigate rich metadata that can provide a lot of context about the user's connections to help you quickly isolate issues. With the right network packet broker, you can filter data based on application signature, application bandwidth consumed, geographic location, browser types that are in use, and even device types that are in use. Some examples of questions that can be answered by this type of metadata include, is there an application failure on the network? Is there a geographic or service provider connection responsible for the loss of service? Are there unusual or increased usage of specific application features? For example, skip tracks, repeats, and so on. Or are there use unusual increases or decreases in application traffic? Let's look at an example to see the benefit. A user calls into the Technical Assistance Center and reports that their online gaming service doesn't work today. The gaming company representative looks at their servers and equipment, and everything's okay. The company also hasn't received any widespread complaints in the last two days. So the next step is to start troubleshooting with the individual. The technician resets the customer account data, nothing happens. Spends time trying to figure out what the problem is. In the meantime, the issue is happening for several customers, but it's still not widespread. If you look at the packet broker and use the available application data, the gaming company network operations center could quickly have seen there are multiple complaints from a single geographic area and then narrowed that down to one ISP. And then the gaming company could have called the ISP and found out that they performed a software upgrade during the night that affected them. Let's look at another example. A knock engineer uses metadata to observe there's an unusual drop in application traffic on their network for the gaming app. That's a possible indicator of an issue. The engineer looks for any sudden geographic drops in the traffic usage. The person sees there's a geographic area where all gaming activity has ceased. And the representative can then go and capture the autonomous system information allocated to each specific ISP using the border gateway protocol. That information is then sent to a NetFlow collector, 
and a PCAP can be created to capture the metadata for further analysis and correlation. That makes it really easy for the engineer. They can now pull up the PCAP, decode it using Wireshark, and use the information to observe the fault. They can then begin resolution activities, often before customers even know there's a problem. Another interesting troubleshooting example is to create unassigned data filters. We call these floating filters at Ixia because they aren't attached to any input port. They're free floating. The power of the, floating, the, the, power of the floating filter is that it's already created and connected to the tool. When it's needed, the tools can instantly be connected to a network port and analyze the incoming data. That speeds up the diagnosis time since the forensic tools are already in place, the filters are already in place, and everything is in standby mode. When you're in a troubleshooting situation, the minutes matter. According to the 2016 Cost of Data Center Outages study conducted by the Poneman Institute, the average cost of a data center outage is a quarter million dollars and lasts for an hour and a half. That results in a cost of about $8,000 a minute of downtime. A rapid response is needed to control the costs. And a floating filter, in this case, is already created. That saves you several minutes, especially if you compare that to configuring the filters manually through a command line interface, for example. A typical use case would probably involve using something like a Wireshark tool or some sort of protocol analyzer. You can also use this technique for tools that you use often. Maybe you've got a commonly recurring problem happening but you don't have a long-term fix for it yet. Any tool that's used often can be set up with a floating filter and pre-staged for problems. To activate the filter, it takes longer to log in than it does to go and activate the filter. You just draw a connection from the network port to the floating filter. It's that easy. If you need to make any filter adjustments, they're simple button clicks. In addition, the floating filters can be connected remotely using a packet broker management system when needed. And that gives you your 24-7, 365 diagnostics from remote locations. I'd like to touch on a couple of compliance topics. Compliance is a known concern for enterprises. Just when you think you've got your network completely com or correctly set up, business decision adds or removes new products and applications to the network that can cause new compliance issues for you. For instance, regulations over the last several years typically demand personally identifiable data be secured, whether at rest or in motion or in use. A common way to secure that data in a monitoring solution is to add masking of the data to protect it as it's passed downstream to the other tools. That's one of the top five most commonly used packet broker features is data masking. Once the data is masked, you can still use it. For credit card data, you could only mask, say, the first 12 digits and leave the last four unmasked. That would allow tools to search the data to find specific credit card number usage. Maybe you leave the first digit unmasked as well. That allows your tools to perform searches and categorize the type of card used, Amex or Visa or MasterCard and so on. Regex, or regular expression searching, is another application intelligence capability that can be enabled to let you search the data as well. Once the specific information or the type of information is found that matches the search, that data can be sent off to a tool for processing, maybe like a DLP. This search capability allows your tools to be more effective as they have less data to sift through, as my colleague Ben had mentioned earlier. And another compliance solution would involve packet trimming. So instead of masking the data, you would lop off the end of the packet. It's another feature that you can activate within a packet broker. There are several low-end packet brokers that don't support the feature, in fact, they don't support several of the other features we've been talking about either. So you might want to keep that in mind when you're researching packet brokers. In any case, packet trimming is typically used 
to make the amount of data sent to monitoring tools for analysis a lot smaller. That allows the tool to be more efficient and analyze incoming data faster. A second use for it is once the payload is removed, this sensitive, personally identifiable information is gone as well. Just as in the case of data masking, the personal data is protected and the monitoring data can be passed downstream to monitoring tools without the worry of a regulatory compliance infraction. There is a trade-off, though. Unlike data masking, the payload data can't be searched once removed. So if that's a concern, you should take the data masking approach. Otherwise, you can use this one. And now I'd like to pass it back to Keith. Thanks, Paul. OK, so I started talking about blind spots at the start of the webinar. I wanted to circle back to this as it's a very crucial topic and one of the most uh, important topics for IT. Most engineers assume that the data they collect is correct. What if it isn't? How would you know? The simple fact for most IT departments is that you won't. This is one reason why security breaches occur and last as long as they do. According to the 2016 Verizon DBIR, almost 75% of companies that were breached had to be told by somebody else. That was law enforcement, customers, or business partners. Those victimized companies had no idea themselves about the breach. Other data from the Panaman Institute's 2015 Cost of Cybercrime Study showed that it has actually taken businesses longer to resolve cyber attacks. It now takes an average of 46 days to resolve a cyber attack once they discover it, which is one day longer than it took last year, and this represents a 30% increase over the last six-year period. Uh, another issue is span ports. For out-of-band monitoring situations, if you're not using TAPS, then span ports will only give you summarized data, as I mentioned earlier. So it's not going to be the full data. This means that critical, i.e. bad data, that happened right before an incident will probably be omitted from the span data, and you may not have the data you need to accurately diagnose the source of the problem or the attack. A third issue is the integrity of the data filters. Using CLI to program span ports or packet brokers uh, or that use CLI is a very common way of creating errors in the filters. CLI provides lots of ways to make mistakes, either through syntax errors or filters being used to provide multiple copies of data to different tools that end up moving overlapping each other, or uh, even dropping vital information. In fact, according to data from ZK Research, approximately 20% of the time that CLI is used to create monitoring filters, it ends up being wrong. The, uh, the command line interface approach results in some sort of programming error. While virtual data centers and virtualization technology have significant cost benefits, they can also pose a significant hurdle to network visibility. ICSIA research from a 2015 survey report shows that two-thirds of those surveyed use virtualization technology for business critical applications. At the same time, over one-third are concerned about their ability, or lack thereof, to monitor the virtual technology. Part of this is simply due to data access. According to Gartner Research Information, sorry, Gartner Info, Research Information, up to 80% of virtual traffic travels in the east-west direction. This means that this type of traffic never reaches the top of the rack where it can be captured by a traditional physical tab or span port. So you literally have no idea what is or could be passing back and forth on your virtual machines. This could lead to security, performance, and regulatory compliance issues. For instance, there are mal malware variants like Crisis that have been optimized for virtual data center environments. How do you know you don't have a security issue in your virtual data center? You'll know when it's too late. The, the same thing with performance. By the time you see a performance issue, it's probably going to be too late. Internal and external customers are probably going to have noticed it first. What you need is access to that virtual stream of data so you can send selected copies of it to your monitoring tools for analysis, just like you're doing on your physical network. The easiest way to remediate this blind spot is a virtual tap. A virtual tap is software, but it behaves like a, a physical tap. You load the software into a VM, and then you can make a copy of all inter and intra VM traffic. Once you have a copy of the data, a good virtual tap gives you a way to perform some basic filtering of that data, and then export it out to a physical packet broker where you can send it on to your existing tools. And uh, by the way, if you're interested in the ICSI uh, virtualization research report I mentioned earlier, it's available on our website. So you can check it out. It's there under resources, and it's called the State of Virtualization for Visibility Architectures. 
Okay, as we deploy more and more technology to solve problems, complexity is going to become inevitable. The rate of increase of this complexity has been characterized by David Cappuccio, who stated at a Gartner Symposium several years ago that for every 25% increase in functionality of a system, there is a 100% increase in complexity. And you can check out that blog if you want that uh, Eric Savitz wrote uh, on Forbes uh, detailing that Gartner Symposium. Uh, anyway, that was a couple years ago, so I can only imagine that with the proliferation of BYOD, cloud everything, and the Internet of everything, that uh, the situation's just gotten worse. Typically, though, you've got four fundamental sources of complexity. The network, new equipment, the tools, and the network architectures being used. We'll uh, look at each one of these briefly. First is network complexity. With new links and office location, when new links and office locations are added, they can be set up with different VLANs, subnets, etc. to geographically segment them. These segmented networks often have separate equipment that is used for remote logon, authentication, and other activities, which makes it hard to, tr to track what's happening at those locations. You've also got BYOD and Wi-Fi access issues to contend with. The situation will only get worse, especially uh, due to data overload, a Cisco report the Cisco Visual Networking Index forecast and methodology from 2015 to 2020 states that the global IP traffic is expected to triple from 72.5 exabytes per month in 2015 to 194 exabytes per month in 2020. Um, as far as network complexity goes, that's another issue. Now, the new equipment, or sorry, new equipment complexity, when you add that, it's uh, you often run into the issue where you're trying to figure out what it does, how best to use it, and how to deploy it. So you've got these issues around just trying to figure out how you're going to integrate it and where it's going to go into your network. The third area was tools. Getting the right data to the right tool is another challenge because different tools need different types of data. So some tools need packet data while others need NetFlow data. And the fourth area was network architectures. So as I mentioned a slide ago, the plethora of different architectures, security, networking, virtual, uh, orchestration, automation can all be confusing. It's often a daunting task to figure out what data tools and interconnects even exist within your network. So as mentioned earlier, uh, the purpose of the visibility architecture is to help you plan out your monitoring strategy. For instance, how does visibility enable or not your security architecture? What data do your tools really need? These are simple questions to ask but hard to answer unless you have a visibility architecture. Okay, so I'm not going to go everything on this slide here. I just wanted to show it up as a, a summary. The one thing I wanted to point out is that with visibility architectures, there is a tangible uh, impact on the mean time to repair reduction. And we've got several case studies on our website, so check them out. And um, uh, like I said also on the earlier with the 15 different um, solution sets, if you found something that's of interest and you want more information, just contact us directly. You've got uh, our contact information here on the webinar, and you've also you can call Ixia or go to www.ixiacom.com. And with that, I'll hand the microphone back to Michael. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Great presentation. And before we get to our Q&A, let me uh, put everyone in the audience to work today. Please fill out our feedback form that has opened on your computer. If your pop-up blockers have prevented it from launching, you can click the red survey icon on the bottom of your screen. And to complete it, just press the Submit Answer button at the bottom of the page. And I want to thank you in advance for completing that feedback form. Again, your participation lets us better serve you. So now let's get to our question and answer portion of the event. As a reminder to participate in the Q&A, just type your question into the text box located to the right of the presentation window or click the Q&A icon on the bottom of your screen and then click the Submit button. Um, we don't have time for many of them. Ones we do not have time for, we'll get a written response afterwards. So please go ahead and submit your questions. Start off with a question from Dr. Lal who says, Com comprehensive performance testing tools. Should the user be a protocol expert to achieve complete end-to-end -end service validation? Anyone? This is Ben. I'll take that. <clears throat> so, so the user does not need to be a protocol expert. Um, I think that when it comes into 
uh, validating the performance, you're looking at things like network capacities. Um, you are looking at things such as tool utilization, tool performance. Um, and so um, it doesn't necessarily force you to be a protocol expert. And on top of that, if you're using <clears throat> clear, concise testing tools, um, a lot of the protocol intelligence is built into those. So if you have a uh, protocol, for example, that is extremely chatty, HTTP being a clear example of that, then those performance tools are going to take uh, into account that chattiness. They're going to take into account the, the aspects that are associated with the chattiness like network bandwidth, network latency, uh, and factor that into any of the performance reporting uh, that's given back to you. So um, it's, it's a matter of being aware of the protocols, knowing which protocols are on your network, uh, which visibility can help uh, ascertain that information, but no, the right tools mean that you don't have to be the expert uh, to get there. And with that, we've actually run out of time, so the rest of you, I appreciate your questions. We will get you a written response after the event. Um, now, uh, to get more information related to today's webinar, please visit any of the resource links available in the green folder icon at the bottom of your screen. Within the next 24 hours, you will receive a personalized follow-up email with details and a link to today's presentation on demand. I'd like to uh, thank you all for attending today's webinar, Six Ways Network Visibility Can Optimize Your Network, brought to you by Network Computing and Ixia. This webinar is copyright 2016 by UVM. The presentation materials are owned or copyrighted by Network Computing and Ixia, and the individual speakers are solely responsible for their content and their opinions. On behalf of our guests, Keith, Paul, and Ben, I am Michael Krieger. Thanks for your time today, and have a great day.